Hi, um, I'm Scott Ollinger, and I'm from the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. I also do work at Harvard Forest, so what I'm going to talk about is a contribution really to both and trying to bring both of them together uh, in scaling uh, across the Northeast region. Um, there's a whole bunch of people who have been involved in this, and there are a lot of other scaling efforts that have to do with food web dynamics and breeding birds and nitrogen cycling going on at Hubbard Brook that, that I won't talk about. Um, and let's see. So going back a bit, where I started, I went as a graduate student to the 1993 All Science Meeting at LTR, and the theme was scaling and regionalization. <laughs> um, and that kind of inspired me as a graduate student. And so um, using data from mostly Harvard Forest and Hubbard Brook, uh, a, a bunch of people had developed a, an ecosystem model, and I set about trying to run it across the Northeastern US. Back then, you couldn't download climate data layers you know, on your cell phone. They're, they didn't exist. So, we had to spend about a year putting together climate data layers, which was a challenge. Um, but we came up with at least a, uh, I would say, a blunt stick that we've been spending the last several decades trying to make a little bit sharper. Um, and we were able to make some hypotheses about what climate drivers affected productivity in different forest types in the region. But we were limited by, you know, we didn't have data sets for things like leaf nitrogen, which is the main driver of photosynthetic capacity and things like this. Species composition was very rough. Soil water holding capacity was a challenge. And then there were things like rising CO2 and nitrogen deposition and interactions among things that we didn't understand that well. Um, so one of the things we did, we went out into the field and started measuring productivity at a bunch of different sites. And it not only did leaf nitrogen uh, relate to AMAX at the leaf level, but it also related to NPP at the whole stand level. So we took some time to try to figure out how can we get estimates of leaf nitrogen using remote sensing. So we worked with NASA, and this is a, a foliar nitrogen image for the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest using aircraft high spectral resolution data. You can see some of the famous watersheds that have been experimentally harvested over the years that have high nitrogen early successional species still growing in them. So I, I would call this success at a kind of local to, to landscape scale. Um, it's also been interesting in that other people at Hubbard Brook said, ah, you have a nitrogen data set. Well, you know, that's sort of a controlling uh, factor in the breeding bird populations because the nitrogen content of foliage is, is the protein content of the Lepidoptera that the birds eat. So this has kind of gone in some interesting ways that, that we didn't expect. Um, we then took about 10 years to try to scale this beyond New England and went to a series of Ameriflux sites where we also had NASA flying its airplane while we were shooting leaves out of trees. And we were able to um, see, for example, that nitrogen concentrations at the whole ecosystem scale also relate to photosynthetic capacity for whole canopies. It's not just a leaf level relationship. This is the leaf level relationship globally for, for, uh, for woody plants worldwide from the uh, famous leaf trait data set. A surprise out of this, though, is when we looked at the spectral data from all of these sites, we also noticed that as you go from low nitrogen, uh, this is a spectral reflectance pattern, low nitrogen canopies to high nitrogen canopies, it wasn't the narrow spectral features that stood out. It was the increase and decrease over the whole near infrared region, uh, which got us thinking about albedo. And lo and behold, if you take modus albedo and compare it with like uh, canopy nitrogen at the plot level, you see this really strong relationship. So this is an example, I think, of where when we think we're scaling something, we often kind of, we get diverted. We come up with new questions along the way that are really interesting. And so um, we've spent the last couple of years trying to figure out, for example, why is that relationship there? You know, there's no real reason why nitrogen, photosynthetic capacity, and albedo should, should be interrelated. So the real interesting stuff most recently has been scaling back down. This is work from a graduate student um, at UNH and really trying to figure out what is it about leaf anatomy, branch structure, canopy structure that leads to this relationship between near infrared reflectance and photosynthetic capacity. Um, it's interesting because a lot of people use NDVI data. The NDVI, most of the variability in, for vegetation is in the near infrared, which is the wavelengths that plants don't use for photosynthesis, which is kind of interesting. It's like learning about your neighbors by going through their garbage and seeing what they throw away because um, plants don't use near infrared light. So this is work looking at things like leaf angle and, and you know, crown shyness and using LIDAR um, and looking at leaf angle distribution and trying to come up with a more mechanistic understanding of why photons behave the way they do. And a lot of this involves going back to the basics of plant physiology, light response curves at different heights in the canopy to try to figure out why we get this signal. 
In the meanwhile, we're at least learning that we can scale this up and empirically we can start to make foliar nitrogen maps at larger scales. We just have to be careful about how we apply it since we still don't completely understand uh, you know, at this level what's underlying that. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs>